Welcome everyone. This is Advancing Clean Energy Access to Households for Climate and Health Equity. I'd like to welcome to the stage, or to the podium, Gillian Caldwell, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary overseeing environmental work at USAID. I'll come home. Okay. Could you guys all hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? Okay. Yeah, come on. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for choosing to spend some time talking about advancing clean energy access to households for climate and health equity. I know you have a lot of choices about where to spend your time, and we're happy you're here at the U.S. Pavilion. As mentioned, I'm uh, Gillian Caldwell. I'm the new uh, USAID uh, climate change coordinator, so it's my job to shape a strategy to drive uh, impact when it comes to the climate crisis. And in fact, we've just released a strategy which is available for public comment. Would love your feedback. Um, and the strategy will, of course, uh, touch on many of the things we're talking about today. Um, I'm just going to make a very few uh, opening remarks because we've got some real experts here. And um, hopefully, we'll be wel welcoming uh, the 16th administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Michael Regan, very shortly. But, um, you know, by way of context, we've got almost three quarters of a billion people around the world without access to electricity. And uh, as you'll be aware, electricity is what's enabling us to do what we're doing here and so much more. And if you don't have electricity, you, you really lack opportunity in the world. So we've got to ensure we power up um, the world. But the, the other challenge is that three billion people are relying for their energy on polluting sources. So as we think about addressing energy poverty, we've got to think also about how we ensure we do so in a way that is sustainable and reliable and renewable. And that's, that's really the big challenge. Um, at AID, we're really focused on three core uh, mandates, right? One is really enabling massive installations of renewable energy sources to help us phase out fossil fuels. Another is the inclusive grid connectivity we need to power our lighting and our heating and our day-to-day -day lives. And a third is energy efficiency in buildings. And you know, I think efficiency often gets the sort of short shrift. Um, there's so much opportunity in efficiency, but it's perhaps not as sexy as a solar panel. So um, you know, we're, we're looking at efficiencies too, how we can reduce um, the, uh, the demands that our infrastructure make on the energy grid. And we can't pick any one of those areas for transformation. In order to get to 1.5, we've got to focus on them all. So I'm really excited to hear from our experts. As I mentioned, we're going to have Michael Regan, the 16th administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, which is, of course, critical to regulating and enabling a safe and healthy environment for us in the United States. Um, we're also going to be hearing from Mark Carrado, who is leading Power Africa, which is um, a U.S. government-wide initiative to address energy poverty in Africa, also focused on trying to decarbonize um, that, that electricity access. Um, Damilola Ogunbi, who's the CEO of SE for All, and Dimfna van der Lans, the CEO of the Clean Cooking Alliance. And finally, also remotely, along with uh, the administrator, we will be hearing from Heather Adair Rohani, who is with the World Health Organization and a technical lead with special expertise in these areas. So um, I'll be facilitating the conversation, but really am excited to learn alongside all of you about these critical intersections between health and equity and uh, renewable energy future we all want and need. So um, over to Administrator Regan, if he's teed up and available, great. Well, thank you, Gillian, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here and to join you all as part of COP26. It's an honor to participate on a panel with such distinguished leaders who are making great strides in reducing climate, health, and gender inequities, and to work towards universal access to clean energy and clean cooking. I'd also like to thank USAID staff, along with EPA, for helping to organize this important event. 
In April, at the President's Climate Leadership Summit, the President made a strong and declarative statement that the United States would once again resume its climate leadership. We also committed to empowering communities of color and low-income communities who are on the front lines of pollution and who suffer disproportionately from the impacts of climate change. As we confront, as we confront the climate crisis, the U.S. government is striving to deliver environmental justice, climate justice, and health justice, which are all interconnected to our most vulnerable populations. Our interagency household energy initiative has a critical role to play. In terms of allowing the U.S. to partner with other countries, governments, local leaders, and international partners to reduce emissions from household energy use and to advance environmental justice. At the Climate Summit in April, I announced that the Biden administration would resume and strengthen our commitment to the United Nations Foundation Clean Cooking Alliance. So I'm pleased to have their CEO, Dimpha Van Der Lans, on the, on the panel today. I also affirmed that the U.S. government would work with clean, the Clean Cooking Alliance, other country governments, and partners throughout the world to reduce emissions from home cooking and heating that contribute to climate change and directly affect the health and livelihoods of almost 40% of the world's population. We remain focused on cooking and household energy initiatives because more than 3 billion low-income people around the world, including 600,000 low-income Americans, cook their food and or heat their homes with open fires or with stove, rudimentary stoves. The World Health Organization estimates that the emissions from these practices expose people to extraordinarily high levels of indoor air pollution that causes approximately 4 million premature deaths worldwide annually. It's shocking, 4 million premature deaths annually. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about this from my colleague, Heather Adair Ronini from the World Health Organization, who is with us today. Approximately 3 million of these premature deaths are from direct exposure to indoor air pollution, primarily among women and girls, and 1 million from the household energy contribution to ambient air pollution. Because around 12% of ambient air pollution globally, and often more than 25% locally, comes from cook stoves and household energy use, these emissions impact everyone. But health inequities are one important reason to reduce emissions from household energy use. Climate equity is another powerful reason. It's estimated that greenhouse gas emissions from non-renewable wood fuels for cooking amount to a gigaton of carbon dioxide per year. You know, this represents about 2% of the global CO2 emissions on par with CO2 emissions from aviation or shipping. Other impacts include the loss of productive opportunities for women and girls who usually bear the burden of collecting the fuel as well as doing most of the cooking. Unsustainable use of wood fuel also causes deforestation, desertification, land degradation, and habitat loss. To address these multiple serious impacts, we need global leadership. And I'm pleased that the CEO of the UN Sustainable Energy for All, Dami Loa La Ogan Biyi, is on the panel today to discuss the multiple co-benefits of achieving the sustainable development goals for universal access to clean energy and clean cooking. To address all of the challenges that I've outlined, the U.S. government has been working to develop a whole of government approach involving multiple agencies and departments across our entire federal government. We are conducting research and testing on stoves and fuels in household energy labs and in the field and building the capacity of regional stove testing and knowledge centers around the world. We're also working with partners to develop and then disseminate ISO standards for clean cooking and clean cooking solutions. We're also engaging policymakers and stove testing experts from, from countries throughout Asia, Africa, and Latin America to help them adopt or adapt these ISO cooking stove standards. Countries have come to Glasgow to discuss how to strengthen their commitment to reduce emissions in their nationally determined contributions, or NDCs. And we are working with partners to support governments that have already included household energy in their NDCs to achieve their emission reduction goals. We will support these governments by highlighting examples already in progress 
providing guidance on implementation and providing a harmonized approach to monitoring, reporting, and verification activities. Finally, on the policy side, we have strongly supported a G20 energy and climate ministerial commitment to provide clean cooking facilities and ensure that everyone, including the most vulnerable populations, enjoy universal access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, and as a key driver to generate inclusion. And we will hear in a moment from USAID's Mark Corrado about how our Power Africa program works with multiple sectors and governments from around the world to increase the number of people with access to power, power that can be used to cook without local emissions. So we have a great panel of experts lined up for you, and I'm looking forward to learning from their many years of experience and expertise. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I'm going to turn the, the floor over to Mark just in a, in a minute, but uh, I have to say it's uh, such a relief to have the United States back in the game when it comes to climate change. Can I, can I have a round of applause? Uh, it was a, a very rough four years, so um, thank God we're back. And uh, Mark, can we hear from you then about Power Africa? Sure. Thank you. Um, First of all, Gail, thank you for that wonderful introduction earlier and for your leadership. Uh, I think uh, I can speak on behalf of many saying that you've been here for a few weeks, but I feel like we've moved a few years. So it's been fantastic to have your energy, your expertise, and I uh, love working with you. Um, and Administrator uh, Regan's remarks, I uh, really appreciate those. Uh, EPA is not officially a Power Africa partner yet, but it looks like we might have to revisit the, uh, the partnership. Uh, those are certainly uh, uh, very inspiring remarks. Uh, we clearly work together on lifting human potential held back by those without access to clean energy and clean cooking. Um, it's a high honor indeed to be a part of such a wonderful panel. Um, I, I guess I, a quick shout out to, to, to my good friend, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess uh, Abzi Jigma of Burkina Faso. Uh, if you haven't seen her podcast, I'll, I'll pitch that as well. Fantastic on what we all can do to get to the, to, uh, the path to clean energy. And talking about other powerhouses, I haven't been anywhere, by the way, where I haven't seen Dami Lola uh, giving a fantastic speech, pushing the cause, tireless advocate for what we all are trying to get done. So her leadership is, is fantastic and definitely the same on the clean cooking side. Uh, two, two people who I greatly admire and are, are very happy to work with. Um, you know, with colleagues like this and seven years of a vision in the making, uh, I feel like I am absolutely lucky to lead Power Africa and, and excited to be here back with all of you back at COP uh, to, to actually make the relationships that will make the difference. Uh, to something we all believe in so, so much. As the largest public-private partnership in the world, um, with these goals. Um, Power Africa, I think, is a really unique player in, in international assistance. We've always been one that said the private sector has to be in the center of what we're doing. It has to be sustainable. It has to be something that people see that is reliable. But we have to take all the tools we have. So whether it's one of the 12 government agencies, one of the 20 development partners, many of which are here, um, or one of the 160 companies who've actually signed a letter of commitment, I'm hoping that together we can push these goals uh, so much further. Since 2013, Power Africa has brought about 118 million connections to Sub-Saharan Africa uh, through uh, 25 uh, million homes and businesses, both on and off grid. So, of course, we don't do that alone. I say we, but it is the, the, the big we. Uh, we're a part, we're a facilitator. We need to make sure we work with people like Essie for All, with the Clean Cooking Alliance, with everyone else to make sure that we put these goals together. As I mentioned, we do that um, through those 170 partners. But I do want to emphasize, despite some success, and I hope we have a lot more, it's not business as usual. I think COP, we're all hearing the same theme over and over again, despite what sub-theme we're talking about, is that we have to mix it up. It's not going fast enough. Uh, there's too many people without power. There's too many people with dirty power. There's too many people with unreliable power. We have to step up our game, and I hope we can be part of that, uh, that solution. So, you know, we need to make sure that abundance power comes together. Uh, I, I, one point I also really want to make sure I hit is that I think a lot of people at times, I think, completely unfairly posit access versus clean energy. And they're, they're one and the same. They're absolutely mutually reinforcing. We have to do both. Uh, they're both existential crisis. They're both ones that have to be addressed yesterday. Uh, so we see those solutions as one where we can push both at the exact same time and need to do so. That is the solution that's going to be sustainable. You know, I think uh, we, we've seen that the ongoing pandemic and global supply chain issues certainly get a vote uh, in what's going on as well, right? So the international agencies, uh, energy agencies' latest renewable energy market update 
uh, does, though, say that they look to see a 40 percent higher growth in 2021 than, a, than they thought about a year ago. And they're putting wind and solar on track to match global gas by 2022. If you were around doing this a couple years ago, <laughs> that, that would have seemed preposterous. You would have said, no way is that even reasonably worth talking about. Yet, I think with ambition and so forth, uh, it is, right? We see prices coming down. We see ambition going up. We see countries with the right regulatory environments moving forward. Uh, absolutely key. So one of those as well is something I, I think uh, hopefully you, you caught an announcement I think is, is tremendously useful is the idea that distributed renewable energy um, is particularly critical. Whether it's a proliferation of mini grids or what we're calling metro grids that can get thousands, uh, if, not, if not hundreds, together at one time in different ways of looking at how else we can build out the sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. The Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, which was announced a couple days ago, which we're proud to be a part of, um, is, is one that is going to look at the solution, I think. And it, no one's quite there yet. The ecosystem's not there. The investment's not quite there yet, but, but it, it's going to be there. And I think with the philanthropic capital that's now come to the table to join development assistance and DFIs, and most importantly, that private capital, that is going to be, a, I think, a game changer over time. Unfortunately, though, lack of affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy results in severe damage on human health and development, as we just heard. I'm not going to list off any more examples uh, of, of what's happening, but obviously fuel and biomass contribute to numerous deaths and illnesses, and so does not having electricity in your health facilities, which I think is another big issue that Power Africa had looked at for a long time, but certainly came into focus uh, as we dealt with COVID. And, you know, and all of us know this, right? Whether you're actually seeing the actual issue or your own life has been affected, obviously and no doubt, uh, you see where healthcare electrification and, and the inability to have power in health units is absolutely devastating for any number of reasons. So we're really excited to try to figure out how to work on community health and boost it through electrification. It's estimated that about 26%, um, that 20% increase in vaccine coverage could be achieved if we electrify the supply chains. So it's not just the vaccines, get electricity there and you got 25% boost right off the bat. So we have to make sure we work this, uh, this problem immediately. Health facility um, electrification compact we did with SE for All and others, where we're hoping to get 25,000 clinics electrified. So it's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of us working together, but we're absolutely excited to, uh, to get this done. Also mentioned before, and absolutely worth foot stumping, is that a lack of energy exacerbates gender inequality as well. Um, women with modern energy access earn wages 59% higher than those without energy access. Again, often we go into this trying to just t tell people this in and of itself how important power is, but power underlines almost everything else we do. So we got, we got the health facilities, now we have women making 60% more than they would have if they didn't have access to that energy. Absolutely game changing, we have to get there. Um, children also obviously benefit from higher electrification. As times is liberated from activities to do uh, and be more uh, attention to school, not breathing paraffin at night, uh, obviously uh, contamination and pollutions and so forth. Absolutely something we have to get done. So that's why this session to me feels like it's the right focal point, the household. It's not the only focal point, Industry has to move uh, on big and small across the board. We can talk about a lot of things, what we need energy for. But the household, for AID in particular, I think, in terms of our development focus, but for Power Africa as a development initiative of the U.S. government, household to me feels like a really important focal point. Um, and so, you know, to, to kind of wrap up, you know, people often ask, you know, you know what do you do and, and, and what motivates you and what gets you? You know, the simplicity and the immediacy of our, of our shared mission is truly, truly inspiring, I think, for all of us and, and for me, no doubt. As I go about my, my daily life, you, know, you often relate back to what's personal, right? And I see my own kids, and I, and I see what opportunities they have. And I, and I, of course, make that one step back to think about how that relates to energy and power, right? So, you know, my kids don't have to breathe lethal cooking fumes. My kids aren't doing homework by paraffin lanterns. Um, you know, when my daughter had to go home for COVID, she could turn on the light, of course, get connected, and connect to the rest of the world. My son, when he goes to the, the, the doctor, no doubt the lights are going to be on when he gets there. And if he has to get a cook up to a machine, that machine's going to work. For me, you know, no daughter or son anywhere in this modern digital era should have to deal with this. So the call to action is just, I think, truly there for all of us to get, get this done. So let's not, let's not uh, waste any more time. Let's take what we're learning today. Let's make sure we do it in a renewable fashion. Most of the solutions are, are presenting themselves are renewable in nature. Certainly in health electrification, I hope every one of those is a solar or some sort of renewable uh, power facility. So not only do we get the, you know, the electrification we need and the health care we need, keep the health care workers where they need to be, but we do it in a way that also decarbonizes health care. So absolutely excited to be here. Gillian, back to you. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Um, maybe you guys can hear me without those, I don't know. Um, 
I appreciate your remarks about me and my energy, but I will say Mark's a really an, 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 an energizer bunny himself, and uh, he seems to eat, breathe, and sleep uh, Power Africa, as far as I can tell, which is good, good for us and good for Africa. Um, so I just wanted to you know, ask some questions of both of you. And can you clarify, is, is Dimpna joining us? What? Yes, no, I'm sorry. What about, um, the, we have one other panel. Oh, there she is. Oh, good. You weren't there until now. Hi, Heather. All right, great. So we're all here. So I want to give you each a chance to um, respond to an overarching question and perhaps you know introduce yourselves and your organization um, in the meantime. Um, just give us a feel. What are your top priorities at this stage in the game? What you know? Where are you finding the greatest opportunity for leverage? And where do you see opportunities to be collaborating either with the U.S. government, as many of you already are? or other partners, you know, what's it going to take for you to be successful in delivering on some ambitious targets? So um, why don't we take Heather, we'll, you know, we'll start with the, uh, the person who's not in the room. Heather. All right, thank you, Julianne. Thank you all. Um, so my name is Heather De Rohani. I'm the technical lead on health and energy at the World Health Organization at the Geneva headquarters. So we do a lot of work specifically around clean cooking, clean household energy, as well as the electrification of healthcare facilities, which was kindly mentioned earlier by the uh, by Mark. So yes, um, I think in terms of you know this right now we have the evidence. We have the technologies, we have the solutions. Now we need the commitment and we need the commitment of all different actors around the world. We need the community to commit, we need the households, but we really need our policy and politi our political figures to really commit and work together. WHO has really taken on stride in this past couple of years to really accelerate access to clean cooking, um, particularly in regards to within the framework of the sustainable development goals. For example, we just established a health and energy platform of action where we're really trying to bring together the health and health actors as well as the energy actors because they both can work to well together. We as the health the health community, we have the epidemiological evidence. We understand what poor air quality can do to the to the body. We have the tools and information to choose the right solutions. For example, electricity, particularly renewable electricity, is the ultimate goal we want to get to all these households. We have the figures, but now we need these people to all be working together in a, in a coordinated way to really accelerate access. We feel, for example, the health sector has a role to really provide this kind of support to the energy sector, the environment sector, or even, for example, in some countries, it's the social welfare services to really help them understand they want to commit, they want to accelerate their population to clean cooking or clean household energy, but they don't necessarily know how. So we're providing them with the tools and the resources and the evidence to help them select the interventions they need, help deal with some of the behavior challenges that are to really get people to change from their old traditional practices to, to the more modern practices and more cleaner practices. And we have, and therefore we need to, we need to use the health sector to help bring that information and that information to, um, to them and to those, those decision makers themselves. And we need the, to really make this a political priority. You know, we at WHO have been working hard at really pulling together with UNDP, UNDESA, UND, and, and the Clean Cooking Alliance, Sustainable Energy for All, to really bring in the high-level political support and financial commitment to make this transition faster. I mean, we've been sitting at about 3 billion people without lack, lacking access to clean cooking for almost three decades now. Three decades, 3 billion people. That's unacceptable in, in 2021. So we really need to be working working further and we're working together to really pull um, our, our, our role. And we're working trying to build the, the knowledge of our, our health sector themselves. For example, we want the nurses, we want the community health workers to really be advocating and speaking to the households themselves saying, look what clean cooking can do, how to protect yourself. And here's some solutions. We're also working with those people at the technical level within the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Energy, to say here are the solutions and here's how you can make them affordable and accessible to the population and encourage their use. And then we're, and, and so these are some ways that we can really prioritize. And the fact that the U.S. government is really committing to accelerating access, particularly electricity, which is the ultimate solution, particularly if it's done by renewable, that's the cleanest for health at the household level, uh, cleanest for the community, and cleanest for our climate. climate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, uh, I wonder, Dimfna, if you can 
comment, of course, on your priorities, but I, you know, Heather made a frequent reference to the need for political will, and of course, that's so often a barrier. So, talk to us about you know what you're hoping to achieve and what challenges you may face in the context of political will. What what needs to change? Yeah, no, thank you very much, and um, I hope everybody can hear me. Okay, great. So first of all, we are equally excited that the US government is back. Um, four years ago, we lost a significant amount of our support. Um, and we are just so honored and delighted to see the EPA really stepping up. Um, and the, the message around a whole of government approach that the US government is now really pushing to make sure that globally, um, half of the world population does have access to clean cooking um, for, for their household needs. Is, a, is really the thing that I think will systemically address why this hasn't been done yet. And so 30 years, same number of people still without access to um, clean cooking solutions is completely unacceptable. And we firmly believe that a whole of systems or whole of government approach is what is needed. And so what the government is in the, in, um, the US government is gonna showcase is what we wanna replicate with the, com the countries that we're working in. And so we recently announced a new initiative that's called the Delivery Units Network. And so our intention is to establish delivery units at a government level, at the president's office or the vice president's office, where appropriate, to make sure that there is a group of people whose only job it is to think about clean cooking. My only job is to think about clean cooking. And so right now, there is not a ministry for clean cooking in any of these governments. And so nobody feels responsible. Nobody's taking ownership to actually make sure that the whole society and the whole government is really pushing this issue forward. And so we firmly believe that this whole of government approach that the US government is now showcasing, which we think is fantastic, is replicated with all these countries where we're trying to implement it because they need dedicated teams, they need really well-developed integrated energy plans that include clean cooking, and then they need access to the appropriate financing to actually build all this infrastructure out. And so that is really what we are focusing on um, in the next two years, I want to say. And then related to that is, is this artificial bifurcation that has existed in the access to energy space that says, here's electricity and here's clean cooking, and somehow they're unrelated. They're the same families we're trying to address. Like, how are we separating those conversations out? It's not appropriate. Like, it's household energy. And so we need to bring these historically siloed sectors together to work together, to be efficient in the resources that are still too limited to actually do our work. And we're really focused on making sure that that really is happening. And so to think about the electrification of healthcare facilities, fantastic, has to be done. But to then send women home where they will use dirty fuels and polluting open fires to prepare the food for themselves and their families, directly impacting their health, it doesn't make sense. Like something is missing in this system. And so that's my job to elevate this issue, to make sure people are really focusing on this whole of systems, whole of government approach, because if we're not, then we are all failing on meeting SDG 7. Like we will not make it. Yeah. You know, on this question of the whole of government approach, um, I can attest it really is a whole of government approach. And, you know, one of the challenges is that that means a lot more conversations at the interagency level. Absolutely. So, in fact, we just got, you know, we just got a survey asking us what impact the substantial increase in interagency level conversations is having on our workload and how do we manage it. So it's not without its challenges. And I think what's very important in the context of a whole of government response is ensuring you're thinking really carefully about synergies and complementarity and avoiding redundancies and avoiding turf battles and all of that, you know? 100%. It's uh, so important that we get it right. And I think the U.S. government is, is really, um, dedicated to doing that, yeah. which is just fantastic. Absolutely, and yeah. I think it's it's if that team exists yeah. and really focuses on clean cooking, yeah. not just in the US government, but in the governments that we're working with as well, that will significantly, yeah. something stuck in the system that we're trying to unstuck. Yeah. Dami Lola, did I get your name right? I yeah. think I did. <laughs> okay. Yes, did. So, yeah, tell us, tell us about your priorities and, you know, what is what? It, what are your challenges and opportunities, and especially in the context of these public-private partnerships working with government? So to start, I have to say I'm a product of Power Africa. When I was working as the managing director of the Rural Electrification Agency, Power Africa funded 20 of the smartest Nigerians to come back home, and we all worked together 
to basically be able to effectively harbor the largest energy access program from the World Bank. People feel, and I'm going to speak from the developing country end a bit, people feel like people in developed country just don't want to do the right thing. They don't want to put policies in place. But what Power Africa was able to do was give the right technical assistance for us not only to get 350 million from the World Bank, but a further 200 million because the team stayed on from the African Development Bank. This is really important because it's local people talking about local needs who will stay in the country after the program and help implement. So I wanted to start off with that. The other point is my only job in life right now is to achieve sustainable development goal seven. So affordable, clean, you know, clean cooking, electrification, energy efficiency and renewables is what I have to do. The other thing that is so critical, just the fact because I'm an African, I am from Nigeria, is this issue of healthcare and how we are going to make sure that we don't have 4 million African women dying every day from either mortality um, failures or the issues of clean cooking. My first project, again, was with a health facility electrification. And that's when, when Mark brought it up, it was so close to my heart. Because we feel that it's a COVID vaccine thing. No, it's not. Primary healthcare centers are where babies are born. When you power a primary health care center, you reduce infant mortality by 40%. So you're saving a baby's life. I really don't know any better job in the world than to say you saved a baby's life. So I just want to put it into context. It only takes seven seconds for a baby or mother or both to die when electricity goes off during any major operation. And that is why it's so critical. And that's why I really want to applaud Mark and his team for the energy compact they have actually put together. In the U.S. context, I mean, it's amazing, the U.S. as a whole-of-government approach provided a whole-of-government energy compact to us at the U.N. at the high-level dialogue in September, stating all the different things they're going to do in terms of obviously reducing emissions, but more importantly, connecting people. We, we seem to forget that. We seem to forget the opportunity that Africa has because it is not, there's nothing to decarbonize, no offense, but there isn't if you take away South Africa. That means the energy currently in Africa has to 10 times X. Those are more solar panels, those are um, investments that need to be made. Money can be made from this. And I think if we stop thinking of the, the clean cooking issue and the electrification issue as this dire challenge, and we start looking at the opportunities, real opportunity for, for, for private sector to really, really come in and do things at scale, we will see it's profitable. Um, another opportunity is the um, supply chains that we're working with. Um, when I was still in Nigeria, one of the policies we put in place was all primary health, especially on the local level, should be powered by solar and battery storage. When COVID hit, we couldn't find lithium batteries anywhere in West Africa. So sometimes when you think governments don't want to do the right thing and they revert, it's because some of the supply chains are not in place. But on a nice note to end, what we've seen with the pandemic is for the first time, African governments have come to us and said, we want to do this clean. What we haven't seen, unfortunately, is what is the clean energy offer that is going to be presented to them very shortly on both electrification and clean cooking, and most importantly right now on healthcare electrification. Yeah, you know, I want to go back to um, you, Mark, because, you know, you talk about the opportunity um, and, you know, moving away from the sort of doom and gloom and towards the, you know, the tremendous things we can achieve if we turn our, our, uh, our ship in the right, our renewable energy ship in the right direction. Um, Mark, tell me about some of the barriers that you confront in bringing private capital to the table, because that's so critical for your success, and it's very much about leveraging. I mean, you mentioned the multinational development banks, but I know that private capital is critical to your success. What are the what are the barriers, and how can we remove those? Yeah, no, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a it's a great question, right? I, I think a, a couple of things. First, I would say is that one thing Power Africa tries to do is work across the board with partners to look at what the private sector needs when they get there, right? So it's one thing to say, come and invest, and this is going to make sense. And if you're in the industry and if you're familiar, it's a little bit easier to see that, that equation. But there's a lot of regulatory changes we have to look at. There's a lot of things we have to do, whether it be transparent procurement, whether it be how to run a solar auction, whether it be just technical, how to improve your grid. Uh, one thing we're going to face a challenge on going forward is that the renewable, the, the amount of renewables we want to bring on 
it's a technical challenge. <clears throat> it's going to be hard, and we have to work on that as well. So a lot of this can be, where does that private sector need when they get there? I think two is that the private sector probably still completely overestimates the risk of, of working in Africa. These are good projects. These have good returns. These have well-run uh, you know, uh, industries and sectors to work with. A ton of partners to choose from. We have to continue to show that you are overvaluing the risk. And then when you see that and you come and you can make the return you need to make to make your business sustainable, and that's fine, that's good. That means you'll be there for the long haul. As long as it's a win-win and we hit our development goals and we make sure we get the energy on and we get the right kind of energy on, that's, that's a great place to be. So we have to do our job to continue to show. And that's all the way from supply chain on the small side all the way up to, let's say, you know, pensions. You know, where's, where's the really big capital? Where's the, the billions and the trillions that really could come in to the sector and be an absolute game changer? I think the endeavor of, of the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet is trying to bring another form of capital to make sure that they mix with that, to, 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 uh, to try to unlock that, right? Everyone still has the same goal. It's unlocking the private capital. It's not replacing it, which is a point I think we all have to learn as well a little bit more. And we'll, we'll say this and, and, you know, and somewhat uh, publicly as well, in, in aid and DFC and, and, uh, and all, the, all the iffies, I think, uh, and now philanthropic capital, we do got to make sure we put our capital in the right place. We got to keep pushing ourselves to take the development risks because we're the ones that are, have the mandate to do the development uh, and make sure that we don't take the private capital out of the spaces it is willing to go and to continually, tirelessly advocate uh, to bring that capital there. Yeah, Tim Fna. Yeah, just to add to that because I do think it's important to point out that um, sort of the private sector is um, really innovating a lot on the clean cooking sector as well. And so, although I think we're a little bit behind on some of the other um, companies that Mark is um, referencing, like we see tremendous innovation happening right now in the, in the clean cooking sector. And that's really exciting because there was still a lingering perception that this was a development issue that was hard to overcome. Completely agree, we need to find sustainable business models that can be replicated at scale rapidly, which will need the right financing to do it. But the important message is that there is a lot of innovation. There are fantastic companies out there and really amazing leadership that we're seeing right now. One of the things we have realized though on um, supporting them apart from the financing and providing them with other assistance is a need to stabilize um, trade and trade environments, especially in Africa. And so we recently announced that we will be working really closely with the World Trade Organization to make sure that for the clean cooking sector, we are stabilizing trade regimes in Africa because the one thing entrepreneurs need is a stable regulatory framework and environment. They can do anything as long as they know what the policies are going to be for the next three to five years because margins matter. They matter in your business, but they really matter in my business where it's like super, super small margins. And so stabilizing anything that has to do with tax regimes, import duties, all of that in Africa will be game changing for my sector. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah. A, one thing I, I, an excellent point, Stephanie. I mean, one thing I neglected to say, you know, Power Africa is, is across the board a, a, an inter interagency initiative, right? The idea of trying to figure out how to also show the private sector the opportunities and working with the likes of Commerce and USTDA, um, others, uh, State Department, Economic Statecraft, understanding that we have things, we have all kinds of clean energy exports and services that are just waiting for a home, looking for a market. So a lot of what we do as well is trying to make sure that on the private sector side, we can see that landscape. We've got to share that information. We have to share it quickly. So the opportunities are there because they don't last long. And we make sure we start building those corridors, building those connections, so it becomes a sustainable ability to, for private sector to private sector. Private sector to understand what government needs and make that a, a virtuous circle. Let me go back to you, Heather, because I um, want to make sure you continue to remain engaged from your virtual location. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, the gender dimensions of the electricity crisis we're talking about and, and the health-related implications of those um, disparate gender impacts. Sure, I, I would love to. And because this is, this is a, an important opportunity, getting access to clean cooking and clean household energy is a great way to really empower women and improve their live, livelihoods, their well-being, and their health. The largest, the largest victims, one could say, from household air pollution are women and girls. They spend the most time in and around the homes, breathing in these polluted levels of air pollution, sometimes a thousand times over the acceptable levels by WHO guidelines, those that are considered healthy. 
and they're breathing them in over and labor breaths all the time. Women and girls have to go and collect fuel sometimes for three to five hours, sometimes daily, which takes it away from income generation, takes it away from them being able to school or just having leisurely time, time to socialize with, with others. So ensuring access to clean and renewable energy and, and accelerating that access is really going to improve the health and well-being of women. And this provides them with opportunity. It also provides them, we have, we've seen advances when you have electricity in the home, a reliable and adequate source, women often can create their, no, their own enterprises. They, for example, we see you know women can do more activities at home for income generation, but they can also be in a, in a way a part of the energy value chain. Women have an important part to raise role in terms of the production, the distribution, the selling, the marketing, and the maintenance of, of clean health, of clean energy solutions. So it really holds it's a, just a great opportunity for women and children and to really build, make that uh, uh, gender parity that we're all looking for. Demi Lola, can I go back to you? I want to, I'm, I'm on this track now just thinking about inclusion and disparate impacts. And of course, um, Mark made reference to um, the challenge of getting some private investors to believe that um, an African investment is worthwhile and safe and possible. What is it going to take to get to a more inclusive approach to electrification? How are we going to ensure that um, the most marginalized communities get what they most need? How are we going to address these historic inequities? And I'm thinking about this because uh, today's our 60th birthday at USAID, and I was listening to Administrator Power um, outlining her vision for the future of USAID, and it's a heavy emphasis on, and Raj Shah, a prior administrator, spoke about this as well, but we're not where we need to be as an agency in terms of making the kinds of investments we want to make in locally based solutions. So talk to us a bit about how we address this ongoing problem we've got. I think to put it in context about, you know, we spoke about 750 million people don't have access to energy, 600 million reside in Africa, and at least about 1 billion don't have access to clean cooking. So nothing can actually happen if you want to empower or get people out of poverty without giving them energy first. You know, energy is key to everything we do. In terms of having an inclusive and realizing you're not going to leave anyone behind, it has to start with the data and the evidence. Where are these people? You know, because we have all these great plans, like I live in New York, you know where everyone is, that's not what it's like when you're actually on ground. So take my country, at least 85 million people don't have access to electrification. We've worked on an integrated energy plan, not just for electrification, but also for clean cooking and also for cold chains because they're all linked together. So you can tell people on the community level how many people don't have access, who is using harmful fuels, what are they doing. That is really, really important from the private sector because you can say if they, if they wanted to know communities with over 2,000 people with an affordable income of X amount, a willingness to pay of X, because they still have to make money from this, they can do this from their laptops wherever they are in the world before they even come into the country. And that is very, very powerful for development organizations to collect that information and make sure it's transparently available together with the government to create those opportunities. And it might not be from everybody, but they would then see just the power and what Mark was saying, just the vast opportunity. People spend, it's just the same thing, you know, when telecoms came to Africa. Everyone was like, oh, you know, it might work, it might not work. Now it's the largest clientele. I mean, the, the largest amount of Facebook users happen to be in Africa. That's why the head of Facebook goes to Africa. So there's a lot of other sectors that are catching up on this. And what we're trying to say, the energy sector as a whole, the other um, area that you know, we haven't discussed because we're talking about household, but Mark knows about this as well, is that lots of Africans know things like electric vehicles are coming. Do you know what I mean? They know they're coming. And again, that's a huge commercial opportunity because every, you know, even, even some of the people who are left behind still manage to afford cars somehow. And people just have to realize that. And I think it's our, our we have to create the business cases as well and introduce government and decision makers to the private sector and bring them together and the regulators so they feel appeased when they come into 
come into different countries about what they really need. But it's that inclusive matchmaking um, role that I take very, very seriously and getting governments like we have done in the UN to commit that this is what we're doing full stop. Dimfna, I want to go back to what you said about innovation, uh, because you mentioned you're seeing a lot in your area. Give us a feeling. What, is, what does that look like? Could you be more concrete? Yeah, yeah. no. Abs um, hold on. Absolutely. Um, so we see a lot of uh, innovation happening around business models. So it's not only just technical innovation. A lot of it is really focused on business model innovation, where we're finding different ways, and our companies are finding different ways to surface those hardest to reach and like really difficult to surface by doing um, sort of pay-as-you-cook kind of models. So it's like pay-as-you-go and other models that we've replicated from the solar industry that we're now seeing being applied to the clean cooking sector, which is really fantastic and wonderful to see. We see a lot of innovation happening on the data gathering, as Damilola was um, referencing. It's really important for our companies to know exactly which customers they can reach and how to reach them best. Um, and so a lot of innovation around data gathering and integrated technology of things like, or Internet of Things applications to the, the um, uh, appliances that are being put in the market. So there's lots of innovations around um, just thinking carefully about how to reduce cost of operation because that's really very, very often the case why it's so difficult to reach them. And then finally, what we're really seeing is an integration. Actually, the companies know this already, right? They're integrating. If they're doing off-grid solar, they're starting to do clean cooking because they're reaching the same people. And so that sort of business model innovation, I think, is, is just a really important um, step forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another innovation and is actually working on this is resource-based financing. So a way to, to give grants but make sure connections happen. Yeah. We are, I mean that was my old job in Nigeria, but we're championing a program um, with Sustainable Energy for All and a whole host of partners on, you know, when customers are connected, that's when you provide the subsidy to them. What it means is that you don't have these long um, procurement timelines that you typically have which cost millions and millions of dollars to actually execute and it might not connect anyone at the end of the day but we see resource-based financing as a way of using smart subsidies much better. Yeah. And for those who are not familiar what do you mean by resource-based financing? Um, resource-based financing means that if you have to provide a subsidy because it's not economical enough to connect a customer. So let's say it costs 800 to connect a customer, um, but what they can afford is if it costs 500. You could provide a subsidy um, for the 300, but you only provide the subsidy to the private sector after the connection has been made. Okay, great. Were you gonna say something about that? No. Um, I want to go back to um, a comment that you made, Dimfna, and this is really open to any of you. Um, uh, about the fact that the private sector needs, um, they need clarity, they need policy signals, they need continuity, and on some level, they need a, le a playing field that's leveled, right? Because there are certain that are, uh, certain companies that are subscribing to environmental and social safeguards and others that are not. I think everybody's anticipating a price on carbon, but we haven't seen it in most markets. Um, talk to me about what kind of policy signals we need, what kind of policy changes we need to really drive us beyond this ongoing um, deprivation of the three billion people who still lack what they need. What would you say? A lot of it really has to do with sort of the import duties because our business is very appliance heavy, if you will, like goods get imported from China, for example. And so a lot of it really has to uh, do with making sure that um, countries are clear and consistent about what their um, import duties and their trade environment looks like. And if that all of a sudden changes, which we've seen in, in Kenya, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, then markets collapse. The businesses go out of business. And, and that is really like the sort of, it's, it's not just one individual policy that will make or break it, but the, they have to be stable. It's the stabilization of these policies that we're really advocating for. I know we have to wrap up a little bit early. Um, can I just ask each of you to give us a, a closing thought? Perhaps something someone said on the panel really struck you, or perhaps you have a message you'd like to convey um, before you know before we we take off. Heather, do you want to start? I actually just wanted to compliment what was said by Dimna on this idea of what we can do for the private sector because that is to push things forward. And the fact that, you know, something that the U.S. government's doing working well, and we've been working with the, the uh, 
US EPA and Clean Cooking Alliance is specifically related to this idea of standards and this regulatory. So we're giving countries ownership and helping them label to let their consumers know a little bit better to make sure that what they're getting is actually clean for their health, clean for climate, and, and clean for the community. So I think this is a, a really important step that's that's taking action that's giving country ownership over their own standards and them understanding what is clean and making sure that their, their population knows that. But and. and and, and just as a final wrap up, I do think that the, the, the really key message that came across here is that we really need to be working together in a harmonious way at all different ways to really make this transition and this shift to, to ensuring the universal access to clean energy for all. And that's when the healthcare facilities, but also in the home and in the community. And it really takes an integrated approach with electricity, clean cooking, and um, all different energy sectors working together in energy actors. Thank you. Okay, great. So we've got time for one more minute from each of you. Mark, what do you want to leave us with? I mean, I, the power of partnership, I, I, I love that one. I, Heather, Heather, Heather beat me to the, to the punch. I mean, I think we have to work together. We have to figure out a way to do it. We have to look at technology. We got to start pushing ourselves. We got to take smart risks. We got to understand what makes sense where we push ourselves a bit harder. I think the market's going to start paying a premium. It already has for ESG. And, and I think people know climate smart. We're seeing people make commitments we wouldn't have dreamed of. Uh, mostly, maybe because it's the right thing, probably because it's the profitable thing. Hopefully it's both. Um, and, and, and people are going to keep making those risks. So we got to keep pushing them to do that. Uh, I think we do that in the power of partnership. We have so many tools within the public and private sector spheres to, uh, to work together. Uh, it's a question of making sure we're committed to doing it. Dimfna. Yeah, um, we need one thing and one thing only, which is more money. Like, we need more money, and it needs to be smart, it needs to be dedicated, it needs to be focused, and it needs to be inclusive. And it needs to no longer suggest we're meeting SDG 7 by investing only in electricity or off-grid solar, cannot make it. Everybody, including philanthropic money, has to move to include clean cooking solutions. And if they don't, then unacceptable. So all we need is more money dedicated to the issue. What about you, Demi Lola? I agree. <laughs> Obviously, we have more money. Um, but um, it, energy access has to be firmly in the energy transition story. Energy access is a climate emergency as well. We are not going to get to net zero by 2050 if we do not achieve universal access by 2030. It's just not possible. And we have to recognize that, and we have to make sure that the 2030 target is kept as a reality, unless the 2050 goals will not be achieved. Yeah. I think one of the challenge with, with all of these targets is that many of them outlive the life cycle of any given politician. So it's easy to commit you know, a future administration to achieve these goals. And that's part of the reason with USAID's new climate strategy, um, you know, we're, we're establishing near-term targets as well for the end of the Biden administration, which of course may continue for a further four years, but the end of the first term. Um, so yeah, take a look at the strategy. We're, we're aiming to um, reduce carbon emissions by 6 billion tons by 2030 so through a broad range of projects, including um, Power Africa, um, including nature-based solutions to really um, preserve or conserve 100 million hectares of forests, um, and a big emphasis on equity and um, supporting uh, the countries, the 80 countries around the world that are establishing NDCs, every single mission is going to be working with these countries to try to make sure we move from an NDC to an action plan that's actually um, achieved, um, which is a challenge. And it, it does come back to money in so many cases, which is why, um, you know, the President Biden's commitment to quadruple our climate finance to 11.4 billion is critically necessary, but we're still um, we're still in the market for more money, right? Um, when it comes to the developing countries that didn't create the problems they're now confronted with. So um, that's so critically necessary. Um, thank you all for your time here today and to our fabulous panelists. And I hope you have a great rest of day.